Hello, everyone, and welcome to Danger on Delmarva. My name is Rhonda Jefferson, and I'll be your host as we explore the dark and winding paths that lead around the Delmarva Peninsula. If you're new here, welcome, and if you're a returning listener, welcome back. Today is kind of a supplementary episode to the episode that was about the Skipjack tragedy in 1939. In that episode, I mentioned that there were not really that many Skipjacks left, and there have been some movements to try to preserve those that are still around. Some are already pretty much museum pieces. Um, They're just for show, for lack of a better term. But... Today, I'll be talking about the oldest skipjack that is still working out on the water. Now, right now, she does have a number of different functions that she may serve, but she is considered the oldest skipjack out there, and her name is the Rebecca T. Ruark. Now, just for brevity's sake, I'm going to refer to her as Rebecca for the rest of the episode. And there were some very interesting things that I found out about her history while researching for this episode. Just a couple of things before I really get into the episode is, one, we are currently under a wind advisory and coastal flood advisory with possibly some pretty nasty weather this weekend, so... I hope everybody stays safe, and I know that the tropical storm, if it is upgraded to that as during recording, it's not actually showing as a tropical storm, but it's expected to turn into one. Um, But I have family where it should be hitting landfall in the Carolinas, so, you know, just, like I said, try to stay safe, whether... You know, you're in the areas where it's going to make landfall or, as is the case for a lot of Delmarva, we normally get some of the residual wind and the rain, but still from the storms that, you know, I can remember and going through, even that is, you know, pretty rough at times. So um, I know that we have everything charged up and like all of our electronic devices and even like a small portable battery system to try to, you know, charge things as we need them, which though, if that goes down or the electric goes down, then our internet goes down too. So, um, we have all of our flashlights. If they recharge, you know, they're charged and batteries for all the others. So just stay safe and stay inside unless you really, really have to go out. But also if you hear anything in the background, it might be some wind currently as I'm recording it's not really that bad it's kind of been off and on throughout the day we would have a little bit of wind and then it would you know calm down and so you know I I really like it to stay like this right now um, with just a little bit of a breeze but from everything I've seen I doubt that Um, also for next month I will be doing a couple episodes that are, I don't want to say Halloween based per se, but kind of go along with the season, whether it be about a crime that took place on Halloween or some of the legends and stories that we hear around Delmarva. So those are just some things I'll be looking at for next month. I do want to have one more episode out before those two, but the one I really wanted to do, I doubt that I'll get the Freedom of Information Act Um, information back by then if it's actually approved. Um, So fingers crossed, but you know, as always, I do have a few stories that I'm always thinking of and you know, we'll do one of those if I don't get that request back um, in time. As always, if you could share the episode or podcast um, or like, subscribe, depending on how you're listening, Um, as different platforms have different options. Just any type of engagement helps um, whatever platform you're using bring 
the podcast further up in the search results so that it's viewable by more people. Also, if you would like to support the podcast in any way for research cost, um, platform cost, and equipment, things like that, I will have a PayPal and buy me a coffee link in the description notes of the episode, as well as links to my other podcast that covers a lot of the same type of information, but just in various parts of the world. With all that being said, let's get into the history of the ship Rebecca T. Ruark. At a couple of places during this episode, there is a question that I'll bring up or point out. One is when we say that the Rebecca is the last, or I'm sorry, the oldest skipjack out there, what really does that mean? One of the examples of when I would ask that question is now. The Rebecca was built in 1886. However, if you do actually go online and look on Wikipedia, it will say 1896, and that to me has to be an error um, because other sources say 1886, as well as newspaper articles that I found on the Rebecca predate 1896. So there, you know, again, must be some type of error there, most likely a typo. But if you do see that, that is. Um, One of those things I sometimes find, especially with older um, instances, where things are not as consistent all of the time. But Rebecca did not begin her life as an actual skipjack. There are a few different things that make a skipjack a skipjack, but one of the main things is the rigging. I will let you know I am not great at telling the difference between different types of rigging, but originally she was what was called a two-masted schooner. And so there were two masts, but there were multiple sails on those masts. There are a few pictures that I found, and I will make sure that those are linked so that you can get a better idea. But um, with the two-masted schooner, that I found um, with the pictures. They look as though they can have anywhere between three and four sails. And sometime in the 1920s, and this was earlier in the 20s, she was then made into a gaff rig. And this is the definition of a gaff rig, is that it's, quote, a sailing rig in which the sail is a four-cornered, fore-and-aft rigged, controlled at its peak and, usually, its entire head by a spar. So, unless you're someone who spends a lot of time sailing, that was a lot of information to me that I am not entirely familiar with. So, I will leave, again, some pictures that will show the difference. And there are some comparison drawings as to the differences. And the pictures... Or drawings that I saw of the gaff rig. It's almost like um, a square that is kind of um, connected at different points and heights so that it doesn't necessarily look like a square. Then in the late 1920s, it was converted to its current incarnation, which is a skipjack, which has two masts, with one of the masts having the main sail, which is usually significantly bigger than the other sail. The main reason that skipjacks are used for oyster dredging, which is still their primary purpose as far as working in fishery services, is that there are no motorboats allowed in the oyster dredging areas, so it really has to be some type of sail boat. In this case, the skipjack has really shown itself to be the best boat for the job. So while listed as being the oldest skipjack, there was a pretty significant time period where it technically was not a skipjack. What it does show is 
the ability to adapt and change that those on Delmarva and those that work the waterways, you know, just how they can adapt to different settings and do what they need to do. So if one type of ship was not really adequate for its purposes, then they would find ways to make it work. And instead of building an entirely new boat, which for most people would be, you know, pretty out of reach financially, the next best option would be making adjustments to the boats that they currently have. Going back through the history of the boat, um, the first article that I found was back in 1892, which frankly was quite surprising in that it showed the way that some captains would treat their crew members. Now, the newspapers at that time were not always as clear and concise as they are now, but you know, it took me a few times to read through this to understand exactly what was being said because it was like a paragraph where there were numerous different pieces of information given that were not connected really. But I'll give you two different instances. One does involve the Ruark or Rebecca and the other involves another boat. But again, both of these show how some of the captains of the time, 1892, treated their crew. So in one, from an 1892 edition of the Baltimore Sun, an article states, quote, Captain Bud Lewis of the schooner Lydia A. Clayville was convicted in the United States District Court on three charges of withholding proper food from his crew sentence being deferred. Then it goes to the boat we'll be talking about today where it says, quote, Captain William Ruark of the sloop Rebecca T. Ruark and Captain Samuel Larimore of the schooner Ella Larimore arrested on bench warrants for alleged assaults on members of their crews gave bail for court. So, you know, at 18 or in 1892, there are multiple instances here. Um, one, a case of withholding food, and then examples from two different ships on assault of crew members, one by the owner and captain, um, William Rourke, who named the boat after his wife, um, where they assaulted the crew. So that kind of opens up already to a dark time and the way that crewmen were treated. But then the next instance that I ran across where she was mentioned, other than um, where in some newspapers it would report any ships or boats that came into port that day, so it is listed there. But the next time I came across Rebecca being mentioned was in something that sounded almost like a war between police and skipjacks, or I should just say different boats that were on the waterway at the time, including Rebecca. Now, reading through it the first time, I really, I was quite surprised. Um, so the article starts out by saying an oysterman's battle and it started in Virginia and kind of led into Maryland because, you know, the Chesapeake Bay, um, some of the waters, they all lead into each other. So, you know, we have the Atlantic Ocean on one side and then the bay comes in where you have the eastern side, the western side. Um, but when it was in the Virginia area, the police, um, it was a fishery police had what was called a severe conflict. And that is probably what I would say is a vast understatement. For example, there was cannon fire. Um, there was also one where it said a boat and it did not clearly identify whether it was one of the watermen or if it was the fisheries police but that they had started out with a thousand rounds or a thousand cartridges, I should say, on board of the boat. But when all was said and done, they only had five cartridges left. 
So it was a, just an all-out battle. So basically, it's the fisheries police came across what was des- described as a large fleet of boats, and there was dredging. It was oystermen, so they were working on dredging. It is not clear, though, as to what the actual um, incident was about, whether it was, you know, out of season, after hours, on a day they weren't supposed to be dredging. That's not made entirely clear, but what is clear is that things escalated rather quickly. So the fleet started out, um, they saw them on what was called Woman's Marsh, and so when a Captain Reed, and though it doesn't say whether or not he was a waterman or a fisheries police, I'm reading it as though he was with the fisheries police, but he fired the cannon four times at the fleet of oystermen. So of course that's going to get their attention when anybody fires a cannon at them four times. And then that's when other boats started to get involved. Um, Many of the men on the oyster dredgers had rifles and they started firing back um, towards Reed. Boats then started to kind of head for cover or to get away from the police. Um, Some ended up, you know, crossing into Maryland at the time. They said that the actual firing of the rifles was pretty rapid. Um, And even though the firepower was not quite the same as what we would have today, you know, when you have one ship that fired about 995 cartridges, you have to, that, that shows there has to be a number of different men with different rifles, just pretty much steadily shooting, you know, reloading, shooting, and trying to get away, which, remember, these are sailboats, so they're kind of dependent on the whims of the rent, the wind. So um, that was really quite an interesting read as, you know, I just wouldn't have imagined that type of conflict amongst police and watermen at that time, or really any time. The governor of Virginia did receive um, a message from the captain of the Chesapeake, which Again, it doesn't make clear what his actual role was, but from the message that he sent, it sounds like he was part of the fisheries police. And this is what the letter to the governor said, quote, had a spirited engagement last night with 15 or 20 Maryland dredgers in Tangier Sound, succeeded in capturing the schooners W.E. Price and C.W. Stevenson, both of Crisfield, Maryland, together with their crews, except Captain, who escaped in a yawl boat, drove the rest out of Virginia waters, all captures delivered to the authorities of Accomack County. And that's where his letter ends. And then going on to the next part of the article, it takes place in Cambridge, Maryland, where at that point there is another captain involved. Um, And that section says, quote, Captain Crittenden Harper of the Oyster Police Sloop Julia Hamilton surprised a fleet of 10 scrape boats working by moonlight in the upper chop tank on Monday night and captured the Rebecca T. Ruark, Captain William Ruark, the Ollie P. Smith, Captain Bird Cannon, the Sweepstakes, Captain Joseph Meekins, and the Pearl, Captain Matt Travers. Captain Meekins entered a plea of guilty to the charge of dredging at night and was fined $50 and cost by Justice Goldsboro. The others have not been tried. And this is where I'll end the story on this one. But in just one night, it was pretty much an all-out fight between different fishery, fisheries police and different schooners at the time. And this all does date back to you know, really the early days of the Rebecca T. Ruark. Now, for the next number of years, there's really not a lot that's going on in terms of you know, major news stories. 
there are times where Rebecca does change hands. And so um, there is a succession there. So I'll get into that kind of briefly, as well as go over some of the important dates in terms of recognizing the longevity that she's had while being out on the water. So Rebecca has been named a National Historic Landmark and was given that designation in 2003. However, she has had some upgrades done um, that were ordered by the Coast Guard because she does now also carry passengers as almost a tour or pleasure craft in a way um, to help supplement the time where she is dredging. So in 2000, um, the Coast Guard did oversee having the installation of a watertight bulkhead in front of the mast. And so even though you know, that's not traditional to you know, an original skipjack, that was something that was necessary in order to you know, keep her going, not only financially, but it does also help make her a little bit safer even though through some of the things that befall her, well, we'll just say that she is a survivor. Going back to the beginning, um, I did mention William T. Ruark, who seems to be not a very nice captain, and he was the one who had the boat built and named after his, his wife, Rebecca. The builder of the boat was a Moses, and I apologize if I don't quite you know, pronounce the name, Correctly, it's Geo Gehan, um, and as I've mentioned, you know, previously she was not actually built originally as a skipjack, but kind of evolved into one to keep up with the times and to best serve um, the needs that she was that she needed to fill. So originally, her home port was in Baltimore. That didn't last very long, though. Um, because it was changed to Crisfield, which is on Delmarva in 1899, back to Baltimore in 1902, where she did stay with Baltimore as the home port until 1923. And at that time, she was bought by an Alvin Cook. Now, after buying the boat, he removed Rebecca back to Cambridge. And so she was once again an Eastern Shore ship. She was later sold in 1939, though, to um, someone named Herman Cook for $5. Around this time, Alvin had actually passed away, and Herman was the executor of his estate, so most likely a relative there with the same last name, and so he took on the responsibility of the Rebecca. After that, though, the next time that she was sold was... In 1951, a man named Emerson Todd and his wife, Linda Todd, bought the Rebecca for $5. Then he sold shares in the boat to a Donald Todd and an Emerson Todd Jr. for $5 each, which meant that he actually made $5 on the deal. Emerson had said at one time, quote, It can go anywhere on the Chesapeake Bay and rain or shine or heavy fog it's the best, end quote. So she was known for being one of the fastest ships, if not the fastest in the area. Also, according to lastskipjacks.com, she was considered by many to be the best oyster dredger. Rebecca served a very long time before there was any other tragedy aboard the ship. In 1979, which from previous episodes, we know there were parts of it which were very, very cold. Um, there was an accident that resulted in two deaths. While going through the different articles, unfortunately, I was not able to find the name of one of the men that passed away, but I was able to find one of them, and his name was John S. Horsey, and it did report that you know, it took a couple of days to find his body, um, that he had been missing after falling off the Rebecca T. Ruark. So, you know, like I said, unfortunately, I could not find the name of the other person who was involved, as when, you know, I searched for any of the name, um, 
for Rebecca T. Ruark and went through any of the Maryland newspapers, this was the only one that came up. So I wish I could have the name of the other gentleman involved because he deserves to be remembered as well. But this did take place in November of 1979. So this was on the other side of 1979 where I'm sure it was still pretty cold at that time, but not as much as it was in, you say, the January, February time period. 1979 all around seemed to be a bad year for Skip Jacks as there were other stories um, that I came across that I would like to cover um, you know, more extensively, but it all does revolve around the weather as well and just how dangerous that can be when you know, people need to make their living out on the water in the frigid temperatures where there could be ice or pop-up storms. You know, things that very quickly happen in the area and can result in tragedy. After the drowning of the two crew members from Rebecca, the ship itself would actually um, lead to the formation of the Rebecca T. Ruark Inc. And, you know, I think probably that was done to protect the individual owners of the boat so that it would limit their liability in the case of one of their employees um, dying or being injured aboard. Prior to that, you know, there had not been an instance where Rebecca, you know, had anybody severely injured or had died on the boat um, because as with the, the whole battle, there was no mention as to if anybody was injured. But this would, just from my knowledge of how some of the corporations um, and the liability work that would help protect the individual owners to a certain extent. Now in 1984, Rebecca changed hands again to a man named Wade Murphy and he was from Tillman Island. Now I've read, you know, about Mr. Murphy in some of the articles and he seems like you know, a person who would be a really good captain. He really enjoys being out on the water as well as giving back to the community. And so even though Murphy also had another boat named the Sigsby, he had always wanted to own Rebecca. He remembers seeing her pass by him at one point on his other boat, and he wanted to own her one day. But you know, considering the time period, you know, 1980s, this was not actually something he really saw as feasible, as that $5 that Rebecca was sold for a few times um, throughout its history probably would not be accepted at this point in time. He also knew that he would probably need to make some renovations to it, so, you know, he could not afford it at the time when he first saw Rebecca. But eventually the time did come where he was able to purchase it. And once he did so, though, um, as patients, they say, is a virtue, he eventually was able to get the boat that he wanted so badly. He did have to have some things rebuilt. And this cost $80,000 at around you know, 1984. So that means Currently, you know, eighty thousand in nineteen eighty-four dollars. Well, that would be closer to around two hundred and forty thousand dollars in today's money. So, that was a pretty big investment. But this also brings up one of the points in time where I have to wonder, with you know, pretty extensive renovations being done and being rebuilt, how much of Rebecca is still the original boat would she or should she still be considered one of the oldest skipjacks currently now since 1984 considered the oldest skipjack that's still out there working but back to mr murphy's rebuild um the 240,000 in today's money probably would have been even more but he actually worked on some things himself along with a friend. He had a company um, named Deltaville do 
most of the work in, tor in terms of the boat rebuild and the function of the boat. So, you know, some of the things that really it would take professional boat builders to do. However, other things such as some work topside, you know, finishing things off that, you know, really didn't require someone to be a boat builder, he and a friend did. So that did save them some money. Along with the rebuild, um, Deltaville also made sure that it could be rigged for crabbing, and this would extend the working time of a boat per year, because if it was just dredging, there's about a three-month period in the winter, but crabbing is done in the summer, so that means there would be more times where the boat could be out on the water, you know, making catch. Um, and if you are from Delmarva, or have read a lot about Delmarva, one thing that we take very seriously is crabs and crabbing. We used to um, go out when I was younger and it would be from kind of a, a dock almost where there would just be small crab pots. We didn't ever bring in like a huge number of crabs. It was you know more or less being out there with family. I think the first time I ever caught one and I opened up the pot and the, the crab kind of came out and again this is not on a boat it was on shore and it started running towards me or crawling whatever you want to call it I remember running and screaming <laughs> you know because I was like maybe six that I remember yeah it just kind of looked at the time like a big spider coming towards me and I remember my older sister laughing um, <laughs> as I was running now I think I'd be a little more um steely when it came to that. Well, thinking back to the question about whether or not a complete overhaul in many ways, does that make it still the oldest skipjack? I do think preservation is very important as, you know, waterways are a foundation of Delmarva. It's, you know, too important even to put into words in a lot of ways. So, you know, I do think it's important to keep examples of the importance of the different types of ships that are used, of how important it is for those families that work the water, and the history that comes along with that. But at what point would we consider a ship almost a reproduction rather than an original? So those are some, or that question just kind of keeps going back and forth, you know, in my head. So as Rebecca continued to work, um, like I said, she's had a number of different capacities. Besides dredging and crabbing, she does something called hauling oyster spat. Now, what oyster spat is, is it's the larvae of oysters. And so, of course, it's very important to help continue, um, you know, having oysters out in the bay. And spat, well, that's where the larvae, it will actually attach itself to something um, such as other oyster shells, um, you know, pretty much anything that it can attach itself to, but oyster shells are you know, some of the main things that the larvae will attach to. And in order to keep the supply of oysters replenished, when you know there's spat that's brought up or you know, if there are fisheries that have spat, sometimes that's taken back into the Chesapeake or into other waterways to allow the larvae to develop and grow. Um, it's kind of put into almost like a cage or a framework that will support it until, you know, of course, they mature some and <clears throat> they become part of the population again. So it's an important role as well, along with the dredging. They go hand in hand because you wouldn't be able to have one without the other. It's also a testament to how the environment and the animals and other inhabitants of different ecological systems work together. And oysters are also filter feeders, and that helps keep the water um, you know, cleaner as well. Now, next to, or next to one of the other most important dates in Rebecca's life is in November of 1999. And Rebecca, once again, met with hardships 
this time through a gale. Um, at the mouth of the Chop Tank River, there were some really fierce winds that were blowing in, and Wade Murphy did try to get her off the water and back to Tillman Island, but it wasn't to be. The sails were blown down, and basically, you know, there's only so much that he could do in that case. He also tried to drop the anchor, um, but waves started coming over the bow, and there was only so much that he could do at a time, you know, only so much water that he could try to get out of the boat before, you know, it really became catastrophic. He even had 70 bushels of oysters on board, and he tossed them over to try to make the boat lighter, bring her up higher in the water, but it still didn't work. So while the sacrifice of the bushels of oysters you really had to be heart-wrenching in a way after all the hard work that would have been put into getting them. His main thought was with saving the boat and saving, you know, the future of his livelihood. But eventually, even with the assistance of boats that came out to try to assist, Rebecca went down. She went down in approximately 20 feet of water, though I did see other reports that said 12 feet of water, but I think 20 sounds a little closer to where um, or how deep it would have been. It said that she was about two miles from land and 12 feet seems a little shallow at that distance out. Not impossible, of course. It just seems, you know, that 12 is a little too shallow. 20 seems a little shallow in some areas as well, but if she was at the mouth of the chop tank or coming in, you know, 20 feet sounds more plausible than the 12. And so Murphy did attempt to have the boat raised, but it failed. And that attempt cost him $7,000 though. However, you know, the media did report on the peril that Rebecca was in, and the governor actually contacted the Maryland Port Authority and they provided $12,000 in order to bring her up. And so they were able to do that with the grant from the Port Authority. And the cost to fi fix the damages in 2000 was $60,000 and that would equal out to today to be right around $107,000. So again, quite a bit of money was put back into fixing Rebecca after she sank. I do think it's amazing how boats can be raised and for the most part, a lot of times they can be salvaged and fixed. So um, this time though, again, $107,000, but a lot of the restoration was made at the Chesapeake Bay Maritime Museum. And I think that's as important as well as in that it was taken to a place that really understood the boats that worked the Chesapeake. I also do not know if Deltaville, which had worked a couple of times on Rebecca, was still in business or not, but the latest repairs that were done in 2000 were done at the museum. This unfortunately will not be the last repairs that Rebecca goes through. And yet one more step in some of the original parts of Rebecca um, being replaced came at this point in 2000. The masts had to be replaced and those were some of the original parts of the boat that were still left. But in recognition of that, um, as well as trying to find ways to offset the cost of the repairs, the mast was given to some wood carvers on both sides of the Chesapeake Bay. The most prominent probably being Charles Jobes of Haverty Grace, and Haverty Grace is on the western shore, but it does impact Rebecca here. Um, he carved a number of decoys from the mast, and those quickly became collector's items. One is even on display at the Smithsonian, but he was able to make 82 decoys. Um, the first 20 of those decoys sold for about $500, so $10,000. That's going away towards making sure that those repairs are covered. 
many of the remaining ones though went for around a thousand dollars each there were some that you know were left those remaining few it does not have an exact number though but those were put up for auction with a minimum reserve bid of ten thousand dollars so i'm hoping that wade murphy was able to you know make up most if not all of the money that he needed for the repairs and mr murphy you know again i said you know i said i read a lot of just short stories or letters that he wrote um and he seems like a really good guy who's impassioned being on the water so he actually saw that there was you know some good outcomes to this and that you know they were able to have some of the um mast saved and done in a way that really honored the boat also it was at this time where you know realizing that he may need extra income from the boat other than oyster dredging and crabbing and hauling spat that's where the coast guard um, instructed and oversaw the watertight bulkhead being added onto the ship before that only six tourists could be on board the boat at any time so even if you had people who were interested in the water and wanted to observe what it was like you know out on a normal day there could only be a total of six at a time but after these um, improvements were made that number went from six to 49 so that means in times where it wouldn't be a working boat in terms of dredging and crabbing they could still have a good income base with people who wanted to tour the chesapeake bay also upon hearing this um, mccormick who makes what is kind of the state seasoning of maryland and i'm going to say delaware too because you know i i have to have it when i have any type of seafood but old bay seasoning so mccormick actually sponsored the new mast and so there was an advertisement for old bay on the new mast so that also helped in terms of cost of repairs as well as operating cost i'm sure another impact that this incident had was it made more people aware of the waning skipjack numbers and it was from here in you're looking at the year 2000 1999 to 2000 where these events were taking place on rebecca that many of the conservation initiatives began to take place with maryland's save our skip jocks or i'm sorry skip jacks task force being formed in 2000 and that was formed within the chesapeake bay maritime museum which is where rebecca went for her repairs after this incident so from there there would be a project that concentrated on skipjack restoration so all of these events did kind of go hand in hand and both helping to preserve rebecca and making sure that wade murphy had you know some extra income in terms of i should say ongoing income in fact that the boat was restored and even improved where he could continue his livelihood and you know, it was just kind of this cycle where everything worked together to have kind of the best outcome nobody would have wanted to see the boat sink but since that weather came about and it did sink there were ways though where there was the recognition of fewer and fewer skipjack numbers being out there working now throughout the years rebecca won a number of different skipjack races um, whether it be Deal Island or Crisfield Days. But just recently, in December of 2022, December 30th to be exact, while innocently docked on Tillman Island, she was hit by a pickup. Or I don't know if you would actually say hit, but maybe landed on by a pickup. So this was not just a minor tap where maybe the truck went a little too far and maybe it just kind of tapped the top of the boat or anything like that no no it actually went through the piling of the dock and landed on rebecca's deck the thumbnail image for today is you know from that incident so that 
had to be pretty devastating. Um, when I first read that it was hit by a pickup truck, and that was the first article I read about it, it just said it was hit by a pickup. I couldn't see it actually going through um, you know, the pilings or anything, but no, it actually did and landed on the boat. So when I saw the picture, it was like, I, I don't know how fast he had to be going to actually go through that and land on the boat, but he did. So I can only imagine at, you know, that point, it might have been pretty heartbreaking and wondering, is there any way that, you know, they were going to be able to get Rebecca back up to, you know, working levels, um, racing levels again, anything um, to keep her memory and just her livelihood alive. But with everything she had been through, she was not going to go quietly into that sweet night and sail away. She was going to be repaired again. But it was with this last incident that Wade Murphy just at that point was ready to give up the helm. And at that point gave the boat to a son, also Wade Murphy. Now, also here, I do just want to mention one of those discrepancies I sometimes find. In one place, the date was listed as December 30th, but in a number or in another one, December 27th. So, um, not entirely sure which one. The first one that I saw said December 30th, but um, one article that was on lastskipjacks.com said um, December 27th. And since that is actually about the history of skipjacks and preserving them. You know, I'm kind of leaning towards December 27th now. So while Rebecca spent about the first half of 2023 being repaired, um, you know, which again, it was not just a small tap by the boat. It actually landed on the deck. Um, it was about another $60,000 in repairs. So not an incredibly high amount compared to some of the previous damages that were done. And I also have to wonder about where insurance would kick in, whether it would be from the truck or if there was like some type of general insurance since the boat was actually in the water itself. You know, what was actually covered, I would think it would be the pickup truck's insurance that would need to cover that, um, which would be probably one of the more interesting claims that came across the adjuster's desks. Um, but... Um, the repairs were made and there was a new cabin on the boat that had to be rebuilt. And to me, that probably was one of the, if not the biggest expense, um, it had to have the fiberglass and resin replaced, but she was quickly back at her racing form. She was ready in time for participation in the latest, latest deal Island skipjack races. She came in second this year. But given what she had been through in the previous six months, I think that was pretty darn good. Since 1988, um, with the Rebecca's participation in the Deal Island Skipjack races, she's won 12 times. And this is a record for both the number of wins and for the captain. Um, as you know, she didn't win this year when it was captained by Murphy's son. You know, the previous 12 wins were all under Murphy, so... Um, she has had quite a run as far as the races that she's won. And Murphy has said that his other boat, the Sigsby, has never won a race. Murphy said that, quote, she can sell, sail herself, end quote. So as Wade Murphy takes a step back after years of being on the water, decades, and running both the Sigsby and... The Rebecca T. Ruark, both he and his ship have left an indelible mark on Delmarva. And even though I have expressed concerns about whether or not we can actually call her the oldest skipjack for a couple of reasons, I do believe that her history, no matter whether she's listed as a sloop, a gaff rig, or a skipjack, she has left her mark and for good or bad, such as in the very early days of her life, she will forever be part of Delmarva's history.
So I hope you have enjoyed just kind of this quick history of Rebecca T. Ruark. And as I'm saying quick, I'm realizing this is close to an hour. So I did not intend for it to be quite this long. So I apologize for that, but I found the history pretty interesting, especially comparing some of the horrendous ways that the captains would treat the crew you know, back in the 1890s to even finding an article where two people were married on board the ship. So it may have started out with some very negative incidents taking a part um, on board the ship, even having almost like a, a mini, mini battle between you know, the police and a number of different watermen. But I think overall, overall, her legacy has been positive and hope that no matter what befalls her in the future, that she finds a way to survive. So thank you everybody for tuning in and listening to this episode. Um, I'm going to try to have, you know, like I said, another episode out before I have the two Halloween episodes. So hopefully that'll be out within the next week to week and a half. Um, I really appreciate everybody who's been tuning in because I have noticed there was a pretty significant increase in um, some of the YouTube viewership. Um, so that was a pleasant surprise. Um, and while I'm not great at making videos, I have made some attempts in the past where they were they were okay for someone who did not have a lot of graphics experience or basically none at all, but it is something I'm trying to learn more about. So maybe sometime in the future, I can get some better quality videos out there to go along with um, the podcast episodes as sometimes I think it's good to have those pictures um, such as showing the differences between the different riggings of the boats um, as well as you know, like I said, the surprising picture of the, of the truck sitting on the deck of Rebecca. So I'm going to quickly sign off here to try to keep this a little under an hour. Um, also again, stay safe if you're on Delmarva or any of the areas that may be receiving bad weather, whether it's you know, from the tropical storm or any other part of the world that's getting bad weather or has befallen any type of tragedy. Just please take care out there and I will talk to everybody soon.